you have to get to a particular place with yourself and with your story in order to tell it. You have had to be experiencing some level of healing in order to be able to relate to others and relate what happened. So you have to first of all examine whether or not you are ready to write. What if writing a book is not just a way to transform the lives of many people, but also a way to create financial freedom and leave a legacy? Wouldn't you want to find out just how to do that? Well, that's what this show is all about. Hi, I'm Henneke Wadkiss, sporter, speaker, coach, author of Podcasts Power and the host of the Entrepreneurial You podcast, inviting you to listen to the Entrepreneur Secrets podcast brought to you by C. Ruth Taylor, best selling in the author and the Caribbean's most trusted voice on entrepreneurship. Tune in for inspiration, information and innovation to write and win with books. Get ready to dominate entrepreneurship. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Secrets Podcast. I'm your host, C. Ruth Taylor, and this is the show where we give you the roadmap to take charge of your publishing and strategies to dominate entrepreneurship. With me is another first-time author, Sharon E. Hepsiba Hermit. She wrote and published her first book in 2021. It's called Brush Strokes on His Masterpiece. It's an autobiographical exposition of the trauma of rape. Sharon has a Master of Science in Human Resource Management, a Bachelor of Arts in Theology, a BA in Ministry, and is the founder of HR Wisdom Limited, a human resource consultancy, and Sexual Shalom Global Outreach, which facilitates healing and restoration for victims of rape through education, mentoring, and training and development. She's a committed Christian who finds passion and fulfillment in helping others to find their potential in Christ and is also a justice of the peace for the island of Jamaica. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you. Wow, you are a very brave woman. Mm -hmm. You have written a book that shares your experience, your traumatic experience of a subject that many of us don't want to talk about, the subject of rape. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your author journey and why you chose to write about this difficult topic? Okay, Um, my author journey started in my teens, where I started a college journal. I wrote poetry, I wrote songs, but um, didn't write, didn't think I had anything much to publish as a book. But then a prophecy was given about 20 years ago that there was a book in me. And so through prayer over the years, being led by God, then came brush strokes. So it was a prayer prophecy and you were blogging. I noticed also as I was doing my reading on you that you write for the Jamaica newspaper and you have a blog. I think it's called A Hermit's Musings. Mm -hmm. All right. So how long did it take you to write this book? What was your process like? Did you re-experience any of the trauma in writing about it? Talk to us about the writing experience of this book. Well, the writing started about four or so years ago in the spurts, you know, because I just thought I was going to write about my life, not specifically the rape. In 2020, it became more, more, more obvious to me that what I was to write about was the rape. And so, you know, yes, in retelling the story, it was a bit traumatic. Um, in doing my research, I learned some new things, um, separate apart from my own experiences. And the book was really a journey, uh, eye-opener, and it helped with my healing as well, because I still am healing. I like your honesty, and I ask because when I did my own memoir, Heartache Queen Unshackled, the first time, there were times when I had to pause, and at one stage, I didn't even want to release it, and I had to question myself. Am I really unshackled? And what is it that I've been unshackled from? And it pushed me to change the subtitle of my book, which was about uh, a journey towards self-acceptance, wholeness, and liberation. So I had to put towards because 
my I knew I was still healing, but I had healed in enough eras to be able to share the experience. So I can relate to yes, that. That's my experience. You get, you get the healing continues. So what will readers find as they read this book and how will it help them? They will find an honest account of what happened and they'll find in it the mistakes I made, how the rape remote controlled my behavior, my emotions, you know, the experiences of my life, you know, were impacted by the rape. I didn't know because how we were thought to think about sex and rape is that it's just sex, it happened and that's it. But then it affects all areas of your life. It alters your personality, it alters your, your mindset, your philosophy, everything is tainted. You know, and so it affected my life tremendously. Without giving away too much of the, the book, can you go back a little bit? Were you raped as an adult or did this happen in, a, in childhood? So that persons can perhaps relate to you because it's, and you said it affected every aspect of your life. Can you just give us a little bit of uh, the experience? Not too much because we want persons to read the book. Yes. Yes, yes. It happened when I was 13 years old, repeatedly. And I was raped by a neighbor who I saw at the time as my brother, a big brother. And even though I didn't know it at the time, it affected how I viewed the opposite sex. I lost trust. I lost faith. I couldn't relate very well to God. Even today, I still struggle with intimacy. I had also illnesses and stresses that led me on a downward, painful path, you know? And so that is how it affected me, really affected me physically, emotionally, spiritually. All my relationships were affected. I was a pain, actually. I recognized that I needed help when I realized the impact it had on others, you know? And so I sought counseling. And that was the beginning of my journey, you know, out of the pain. Thank you. That's a good uh, way to segue because I was going to ask you, how did you heal from that? And can you help us to, to chart the journey of healing for someone who is suffering from the trauma of rape? Well, first and foremost, you have to recognize that it does affect you. Uh, many of us are um, me included before I knew all about it. Just put it aside, you know, based on how society saw sex and sexuality. I mean, it's just a meeting of bodies, but no, it's not. The Bible says the two become one flesh. And so um, this person who raped me became a part of me, you know, and um, affected how I saw myself. My self-esteem took a plunge. Everything about me just went downward, you know? And so... Um, the person needs to recognize that something happened, something bad, something evil. It was not their fault. It's certainly not their fault. Even though society sometimes put the blame squarely at the victim's feet, blame it on how they dress or if they're too flirty, flirty or whatever, whatever, whatever it is. Nothing gives somebody else the right to rape you. So you are a victim and not the, the person who caused it and not the person who is to be blamed then you need to talk about it. Find somebody you can trust to talk about it. Explore what you're feeling, explore the painful points, etc., etc. And lastly, I recommend you read my book because it is a first-hand experience of the issue and all the things, it affected my finances, everything. You know, and some, some things would not relate to, 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 to the sexual um, problem, like father wounds. I didn't know that because I had an absentee father and my mother was away working, I was more likely to be raped than anybody else. You know, so all of those things are affected and, and come into the play. You know, so you learn a lot about, you know, what surrounded the rape, about the feelings that you go through and about what can help. Talk to us, Sharon, about the title of the book. You have a very interesting title. What's the story behind the title of the book? Actually, um, the book, I, I, when I started writing, I thought of calling it Snapshots of Sharon. But then um, I usually go before the Lord every 
birthday. And on my birthday of October 2020, I did my user practice and he told me the name of the book. At first, I, you know, it didn't sit too well with me, but then I began to like it. And he gave me a poem that illustrates what he meant by brushstrokes and his masterpiece. If you read the book, you'll see that poem at the front of, of, of the book. And it really gives, uh, gives a, a, a good view of what God, I mean when I say brushstrokes and his meaning God's masterpiece, because I am God's masterpiece. And he uses all the brushstrokes, good, bad, indifferent, the rape, everything to make me who I am today. And so that is why I think the title is appropriate. And then the subtitle from The Humiliation of Rape to Exaltation in Christ. How do we con connect the two? I can understand you being God's masterpiece. And these were rough brushstrokes boom, 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 yeah. on his masterpiece. But yeah. from The Humiliation of Rape to Exaltation in Christ. Um, it's just that you, uh, you find freedom in Christ. Um, you find liberation in Christ. He teaches you how to forgive and how to, to love yourself and, you know, how to um, love others and wanting to help others to overcome their, um, their, their, their difficulties. And along the way, he encourages you from his word and he speaks to you. He tells you you're his trophy. He tells you you're wonderfully made. He tells you you're, you're, he tells you you're valuable. You know, you are, you know, you are, you're, you're, you're just all that in a bag of chips. You know, and God just builds you up and exhausts you. You know, um, God is not a God who believes in taking all the glory for himself. He glorifies you too. You know, and so that's where the exaltation comes in. As you are healed, as your mind changes, you start the lies about God that you suck. You were believing when you were raped. You know, you believe that God didn't care and you believe that he didn't love you, etc., etc. As you begin to come over and get over those lies, then you begin to see yourself as you really are in him and the potentials that he has blessed you with and how he wants to move you forward in life. That's interesting because I was going to ask, how is it that you are still a Christian? How could you have found God in this? I mean, I would have said, God, why you allow this to happen to me? And my perception of God would be that he's an awful God because why would God allow such evil to happen to a 13-year-old? So for the woman, person out there who is struggling, who has been raped and they're struggling with God, what word do you have for them? I struggle with those very questions. Got angry with God, suffered disappointment with God, very distant from God, didn't feel I could get close to this God who allowed such a terrible thing to happen to me. Until he opened my eyes to the fact that when he made us, he made us in his image and likeness. With the ability to choose whether we live good or we live evil. And I said, but God, you're all powerful. Why would you allow him to, to why did you stop him? And he said to me, um, you know, through conversation, he said to me, how do you feel when you really, really want to do something and somebody stops you? How do you feel when you have this overpowering desire to do something and no matter how people persuade you, you still want to do it and you think it's the best thing and then somebody more powerful than you stops you? You feel violated. You feel as if you're not a human being. You feel like a robot. I, I, I mean, and I have a power of choice. And so therefore, he allowed me to see that this man had the power to choose whether or not he would rape me. And he chose to rape me. So he chose to be the perpetrator of rape. And that choice had a lot of mix-ups in there because he also didn't have a father. All the other emotional stuff that might have been going on with him, you know, I didn't even see at the time at the summer as this monster. But over time, I've learned to realize that emotions drive you. Your experiences in life drives you. Um, you don't have a father figure to show you things. You don't know how to do life. And so you make mistakes. And the rape was one such thing. Wow. So I hear you, in a sense, empathizing 
although not excusing. That's so, not excusing. That's so, not excusing. So that is good. How are you now using the book? What's the feedback and how are you now using this book? Well, the, the feedback has been great. I had a person, set a person, about five or six persons read the book while I was writing and their feedback was wonderful. Um, I've had um, a review on, on Amazon. Somebody gave me five stars for the book. I've had uh, Dr. Mark Verkler, who is on the who's who's list in the world for many years and in the USA. He called my book outstanding, wrote a blog about it and sent a blog to other publications, you know. Many readers who have bought the book have, you know, really commended me on my writing style and on the honesty of the book and the content that is really helpful and memorable. So um, I've had very, very good reviews about the book. No, authorpreneurship is about leveraging the book. Mm -hmm. and creating products, programs, and services around it for greater impact and also to increase your income. How have you used this book? What have, what, what have you used it to do? And I think uh, you started doing something with the book yes. from the get-go. So talk to us about that. Conference, Sex Shalom Conference um, came out of the book. And I've had speakers, international speakers at the conference speaking around topics that were um, discussed in the book. You know, um, since then, I've had monthly meetings um, with persons for various aspects, understanding sexual abuse, father wounds. You know, um, I've also been um, on interviews and stuff where I propose solutions to um, the issue of rape. Like, the, the, you know, at the root of rape is fatherlessness, you know, um, it's, it's a dysfunctional family, you know, where a father is absent and research shows that a boy who was raised without a father is 14% more likely to commit rape than others who did, you know, so it's multifaceted and, you know, multi roots. And so it's a big thing. And even though, yes, I've had good responses, I know there's still some um, persons and um, institutions who will not readily embrace, because as I said, you know, it's not an easy topic to discuss, but talk about it, we must. And I believe that it is church that must be the discussion. I believe that we are charged as followers of Christ to show the Father's heart to people who are suffering. Right? And rape victims need to know the father's heart and who better to show it than the church. And so that is my mission <laughs> to bring the spotlight to people like me who have suffered for years in silence and, you know, suffered in many ways, you know, without help or recourse. I want to commend you on doing that. You are a very courageous woman. And as you share, I'm reminded of the scripture. I know not everybody listening to this podcast is a, is a Christian, but there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4 that says, he comforts us, God comforts us in all our trials that we can comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received. Yes. In other words, as you have gone through trauma, and having been healed, those very same strategies that you learn to heal, you can now use that with others who are hurting. Definitely. And therein lies a sense of purpose and contribution that you can make. Now, Sharon, for those, for the person who's been through some traumatic experience and wants to write a book and tell their story, what are some of the tips that you can share to guide them in that process? Well, first of all, to examine whether they are ready to write about it, uh, because you have to get to a particular place with yourself and with your story in order to tell it. You have had to be experiencing some level of healing in order to be able to relate to others and relate what happened. So you have to first of all examine whether or not um, you are ready to write. Having determined that you're ready to write, you need a support group. You need persons around you who will encourage you, who will pray for you, who will read what you write, give you feedback, honest feedback. I had a lovely support group in the Entrepreneurship Secrets Group. Kamika was, was, was my number one cheerleader throughout the way, you know. And um, 
I got support from others who, you know, just kept encouraging me not to give up. Because there are many times I felt like I didn't want to write. There are many times I felt like, what's the use? You know, um, what is what is my story going to do? But then doing it has, you know, changed my view quite a lot. So I say, go for it. Be ready. Build your support group. Get your finances in order because publishing can be expensive. Um, get some persons who will give you honest feedback who will not pull punches, but give you honest feedback in love. So you can go and do a good job of it. Because you want to write something that will impact lives. It makes no sense to go to the expense of publishing a book which has no impact. You want to ensure that your work has impact. And one of the ways to do that is to be honest and to tell your story forthrightly. So those are my, my, my tips. And you said something that I want to pick up on. Publishing can be expensive. One of the reasons I started the Entrepreneur Secrets Academy is to help persons who are struggling financially to publish without breaking the bank. How did you find that experience in terms of working with me in the Entrepreneur Secrets Academy and your publishing journey? And why would you encourage others to participate in the academy or use this option rather than taking an expensive publishing package? Your package is excellent. They, you have a tutorial site where you can get all the information you need about the book process. Everything is there in simple, plain language, easy to understand, no rocket science. Also, you have access to a group of people who can give you valuable feedback. You learn technical skills. Um, I learned Microsoft Word more during the course, um, during the time with, with um, the entrepreneurship secrets and strategies of how to um, write the book, of how to market the book. You get everything from pre to post and even post post because right now, you know, we're having this conversation and Kamika and I are still very much involved in the book. You know, she's still very much involved in cheering me on and putting posts on Facebook. Thanks, Kamika. You've been very supportive. And persons who want to come on board can expect that kind of treatment from you. You make yourself available and you, you're a coach. And so you have that kind of hands-on, personal touch. And yes, it was less expensive than it would have been had I gone to the other route around going with, a, with, a, with a, a, another... Um, way of doing it rather than do it entrepreneur secrets you know so it was a good deal it was worth my time and worth what i spent i would do it again and again and again you know so i, <laughs> I recommend persons to pursue um that 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 process with um kamika and her uh, company i smiled when you were um, giving the feedback just now. So thank you very much because Garfield <laughs> Robinson, who shared last week, he used some of the same language. He said, I would do this again and again and again and again. And to hear you use the same words for me is heartwarming. And it says to me that uh, what I am doing is working and Definitely. I'm seeing the results. Because when I just started, I wasn't sure, you know, how do I translate my own experience of publishing on a budget to help others to do it so that they, they could learn? Because many persons don't want to take charge of their publishing. They want somebody to manage everything for them. So this approach was new and I'm glad you were you know, up to the task and you found it rewarding. But, but the task not like you, <laughs> I couldn't do otherwise, you know, and <laughs> you were just at me, at me, at me, get up, Sharon, do this, you know, so, um, and that was part of the value of the whole experience. Yes, I'm passionate about Caribbean people telling our stories, but uh, if you were to do this over again, what are some of the things you would not do and give other first-time authors who are in the process of publishing some tips. So what are some of the things you would not do again or do better and just give first-time authors watching this some tips to make the process easier for them and more fruitful? What I would not do again 
is um, when I, I do a lot of research in my books and I waited a bit too long to ask for permission to use the works and some permissions I did not get. So I had to do a rewriting um, near the time when I was supposed to be sending out the book to the editor. And so that was a, a costly mistake, you know, both in time and, um, and money, you know. Um, so I encourage persons, I mean, if you realize that you're going to need permission to use other person's work, to approach them as quickly as possible and get that out of the way before pursuing or continuing to write. So as I said before, get your finances in order. I am a faith-filled believer in Christ, but there are a few anxious moments, you know? And so had I had something put aside for that purpose, it would have been an easier time. There would, be, there would have been less nail biting, but God brought me through. I wouldn't recommend the same for others. So get your, put yourself uh, a budget in place. You know where you're going, pray about that, definitely. But put your plans in place and get the thing properly streamlined, you know? So that those are the two things that, you know, really um, had me um, challenged. So prepare for writer's block. Prepare for the times, especially the writing about the trauma. Prepare for the times when you're going to feel like, oh boy, I can't, but I'm not doing this, you know? And as I said, get your support group in place. Get those persons who will push you and encourage you and prod you. I like that. Asking persons, I've never heard that one. And so I believe you've just shared some golden tips because once you're using works that are copyrighted works, you really need the permission of the person and uh, be careful of using lyrics and some of those uh, things. And don't say, I wrote an ax and I didn't get permission and you go ahead mm -hmm. anyway. No, I, I like the approach <laughs> that you took to, to rewrite. Yes, you can, especially if the book takes off. When you're right. unknown, it's not so bad. But as soon as you're out there known and your book can take off at any stage, it could be 10 right. years later and right. then a whole heap of money start coming in. And that's when people start looking to sue you. Right. Right. So you have to be very careful. Very careful. As we bring this interview to a close, Sharon, what is your dream for your book and your ministry? What is that dream? What does it look like in the next three to five years? I want to see a set of transformed individuals who are being healed because I believe the healing is a lifelong process because there are still some things that you need to discover about yourself, about what happened, etc. Research is continually being done. But I want to see a set of individuals who are transformed, who know that God loves them, that um, he's not sitting up there, you know, just not caring about what happens to them. He loves them. His heart towards them is our father. And they can now go forward and help to heal others. Because rape is something that has been happening for millennia. And it continues and continues and continues and continues. And so sad to say, there are always the persons who need help and healing from the trauma of rape. And so I want to see through my, my book and through my programs, my, my support group, my uh, monthly meetings, one-on-one um, -on -one talk, counseling, mentoring. I want to see a set of persons who are so impacted that they can impact others. I love it. And that's our vision. We don't just want you to write a book and put it on a shelf. We want you to leverage that book. And when we talk about impact, this is what we're talking about. It's really about helping others, playing a role in transformation, creating positive change. And we pray that it will also become financially fruitful for you, that you'll get speaking engagements, that you'll have paid programs, and that others will take this book and it will really take off. So for persons who are interested in contacting you and being part of your ministry, how can we find out more about you and get in touch with you? Okay, so you can find out more about buying by, by, by my book. <laughs> um, it's available on Amazon in ebook and paperback um, format. It's also available in Trinidad from Christian Solidarity Movement, pastor by um, Douglas Gibson. And you can contact me at ahermitsmusing at gmail.com. And we'll put those links in the show notes. 
I just want to tell you, thanks, Sharon, for coming to share your story and your first time author experience as we seek to help more persons to share their stories and change lives. Thank so, you so much for having me. All the best. Take care. Bye bye. I'm Tamara Francis, educator and editor. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and share the podcast with your network. If you'd like to increase your impact and income with books, visit authorpreneursecrets.com for more resources, including the books, Can It to Win It, and Authorpreneur Secrets. Join the Authorpreneur Secrets Academy membership group for courses, coaching, and community support to write, publish, and win with books. Enrollment is in January and June each year. You may also sign up for one of Ruth's Publishing Made Easy courses or private coaching to write and publish your next book. Until next time, go pen it to win it.